Hello everybody and welcome back to my channel. So the case that I have for you guys today is probably one of the most baffling disappearances that I have ever researched and I'm really looking forward to hearing what everyone's theories are and thoughts are down in the comments after the video. So with all of that being said, let's get into today's case. Today, we are going to be discussing the unsolved disappearance of Leah Roberts. Leah Roberts was born on July 23, 1976 in Durham, North Carolina. She was the youngest of three siblings, her brother Heath and a sister named Kara. She was described as being very outgoing and adventurous and loved spending time with her family and her siblings. She was a dedicated vegetarian and played soccer in college. Now, she seemed to have a relatively normal upbringing when she was younger, However, things took a turn for the worse when she turned 17 years old, and after that, things seemed to get only worse from there. When she was 17 years old, her father was diagnosed with a serious chronic lung disease. This was obviously very stressful for her and her family, and it was just not an easy time for her. Then, after graduating high school in 1995, she continued her schooling at North Carolina State University in Raleigh to study Spanish and anthropology. While here, during her sophomore year at the age of 20, Leah's mother actually died unexpectedly from heart disease. After this, understandably, she needed to take some time off from school for a bit to just mourn the loss of her mother and deal with everything that was going on in her life. It was the fall of 1998 when Leah returned to school to resume her studies. However, as her luck would have it, after she finally returned to school, she got into a very serious car accident after a truck went and pulled out right in front of her. This resulted in her sustaining a punctured lung and a shattered femur. The fracture was so bad that she had to have a metal rod placed in her femur to make sure that it would heal properly. Obviously, this was a super intense accident and she honestly thought that she was going to die from it. However, after she came out of surgery and began to heal, she told her family that it was as if she had been born again. She suddenly had this new appreciation for life after having this near-death experience and decided that she wanted to change the path that she was on. But once again, there was yet another tragic turn of events in Leah's life. Now, after returning to school, she had actually been planning on going to Costa Rica for a field program. However, in 1999, about six months after Leah's car accident and about three weeks before she was supposed to leave for Costa Rica, her father ended up passing away from his lung disease. After this, she did still decide to go on her Costa Rica trip and she only had one semester left of college before graduating, but she decided that this just was not for her. She decided at this point to just leave college so that she could go out and live her life to the fullest. Her brother and sister were not thrilled about this decision and they tried to convince her to just stick it out for another six months, but Leah wanted nothing to do with it. At this point, Leah was 23 years old and she had already experienced more tragedy in such a short period of time than most people experience in a lifetime. She decided to go ahead and move in with her friend Nicole and just do her for a while. She took this time and learned how to play guitar. She started getting into photography. She would go out to different coffee shops and just wanted to chill there and write poetry and write in her journal. She also decided to adopt a cute little kitten who she named B. Now, on the morning of March 9th, 2000, Leah and her sister Kara had talked on the phone for a bit and they had sort of discussed some future plans that they had had. According to Kara, the two hadn't really set up anything specific, but they had talked about getting together sometime in the near future. I imagine it was one of those conversations with, you know, a friend or family member when you're just like, oh yeah, let's, you know, get together soon and, you know, hang out and see each other. A few hours later that same day, Nicole had asked Leah if she wanted to come with her for a babysitting thing that she had going on the next day and Leah agreed. That evening, Nicole got ready for work as normal. However, when she returned back from work later that night, she noticed that Leah and her 1993 Jeep Cherokee were both missing. At first, Nicole didn't think too much of this because Leah was known to be adventurous and would sometimes just 
decide to take off on random adventures without telling anyone since she dropped out of school. In this time in her life, obviously she didn't have any classes to attend. Then on top of that, she had received some money from her parents' inheritance after they passed away. So she also didn't have a job at this point. So she really didn't have anything holding her back. So realistically, she could pretty much just go off and do whatever she wanted whenever she wanted. But by the next day on March 11th, Leah didn't show up to the babysitting gig that she had agreed to go to with Nicole and she didn't come home that evening. By that Monday, March 13th, not only had Nicole not seen Leah, but family and friends started calling to see if Leah was there because they hadn't seen her either. So of course, this really concerned Nicole, so she decided to go ahead and call Leah's sister, Kara. She explained that Leah was absolutely nowhere to be found and that she hadn't seen or spoken to Leah in days. So at this point, Kara decided to call the Durham Police Department and reported Leah as missing. So by March 14th, the next day, Kara and Nicole went and searched through Leah's room only to find that a ton of Leah's clothes were missing. They also noticed that her cat B was missing. In addition to this, they had also found a note in Leah's room that said, I'm not suicidal, I'm the opposite. She also decorated the note with a little drawing of the Cheshire's cat, Grin. This can be interpreted as maybe she was acting a little bit mischievous, but it also suggests that she was probably in good spirits when she made the note. She had also referenced the author, Jack Kerrick, in her note, who wrote about travel and self-discovery and taking spontaneous trips. This was the same author that Leah had spoken a lot about to her friends, specifically about one of his books that recounts Jack's time as a U.S. Forest Service outlook on Desolation Peak in the Northern Cascade Mountains in the Pacific Northwest. Also along with the note, Leah left a stack of cash which totaled about a month's worth of her share of rent and utilities. Now, like I mentioned earlier, Leah had gone on a trip to Costa Rica shortly after her father died. When she did so, she was obviously going to be out of the country, so Leah gave power of attorney over her bank account to her sister, Kara. Of course, in case if anything happened while she was out of the country or just for extra protection. Well, at this point, Kara still had access to Leah's accounts and was able to see all of her banking information. She was able to see that Leah had actually withdrawn about $3,000 from her bank account on the afternoon of March 9th and then used her debit card to pay for a room at a motel near Memphis, Tennessee. They also saw that she had used her card to buy gas and food in a direction that suggested that she had been traveling west along Interstate 40, then north on Interstate 5 once she hit California. The activity on her account continued with purchases of gas and food until around midnight on March 13th. The last purchase that she had made was in Brooks, Oregon when she bought gas. After this, all transactions stops. So it was clear to Leah's friends that she wanted to travel to the Pacific Northwest because she wanted to see the area that her favorite author had written about for herself. She wanted to see the Cascade Mountains of Washington, which was known for its amazingly beautiful landscape. At this point, Kara was very relieved to see that Leah just left to go and see the mountains for herself for a bit. Even though the transactions on her account did stop for a bit, Kara wasn't that worried because she knew what her sister was up to and knew that she had taken out $3,000 worth of cash. She had no reason to believe that anything bad was going to happen to Leah. She had left a note with a silly little drawing on it indicating that she was in a very good state of mind. She had only left a month's worth of rent and utilities for her roommate indicating that she wasn't intending on being gone for longer than a month. Plus, she was very clearly using her bank account, not trying to hide anything from her sister who she knew had full access to her banking information. Again, she took a good bit of cash out of her bank account and showed clear signs of just wanting to get away and be off the grid for a bit, you know, because obviously she didn't tell anyone when she was going or where she was going. So it made sense if she wanted to stop using her debit card for a bit so that no one would come looking for her. However, Kara's relief did not last very long. 
March 18th was her 26th birthday and even though Leo was off the grid for a bit, she was still expecting a call from her little sister to wish her a happy birthday. Instead, she received a very concerning phone call from an officer from the Whatcom County Sheriff's Office in Bellingham, Washington. Officers had told Kara that earlier that day, joggers had discovered a very badly damaged white Jeep at the bottom of a ravine in a densely wooded area near Canyon Creek Road, just after where the road goes into a sharp curve at the top of a slope. This is a side road off of the Mount Baker Highway that goes into some isolated residential areas and logging camps around Mount Baker Sinaliquam National Forest, which is just a few miles south of the U.S.-Canada border. They had also discovered some random articles of clothing along the side of this same road, some of which had been tangled within tree branches on some nearby trees. Obviously, when the joggers saw this, they were very concerned, so they called police right away, and when authorities arrived, they very quickly were able to match the license plate number to Leah's Jeep Cherokee. So, going off of the path that Leah would have taken and taking into account the amount of damage to the car and the surrounding trees, Detectives determined that the Jeep must have been going about 30 to 40 miles per hour when it went down the road and off the hill. The items inside the car were tossed all around, which indicated that the car had rolled over several times on the way down. So at this point, most people would think that there would be a total break in the case and tell us exactly what happened to Leah. However, after looking further into the car, the entire scene left investigators with even more questions than answers. So initially, when looking through the vehicle, they found Leah's passport, her checkbook, her credit and debit card, her license, her clothes, and her guitar tossed all around the car and the ground near the car. They also found cat food and a cat carrier within the car, but they didn't find Leah's cat B anywhere. So all of that pretty much makes sense. However, police did not find a single drop of blood within the Jeep. The windshield of the car was cracked and broken, but there was no blood or an obvious impact mark to where a body or a head hit it. They also saw that there was no damage to the steering wheel and the driver's side seatbelt had not been stretched from abruptly pulling against a body, preventing it from going forward during the crash. They also did not find any sign that anyone had walked away after the crash, not only because of how badly the car was damaged, but because they found no tracks or no footprints anywhere around the car. So this almost pointed to no one even being in the car when it crashed and rolled down the hill. Police initially thought that maybe she had staged this crash and then just ran away somewhere, but then they found that there were actually pillows and blankets hung up inside the windows, indicating that she or someone else had been using the car for shelter after the crash. So, given all of this information, it appears that no one was in the car when it crashed, but someone had been in the car after it had crashed. It was obvious that Leah had purposely went missing to go on this road trip and she brought her cat, but the cat was absolutely nowhere to be found around the car and there were no signs that her or the cat had been harmed in any way. So at this point, the thing that made the most sense to police was that she crashed and then was harmed despite there not really being any evidence of her being in the car and then had wandered off into the dense woods and maybe was hiding out or was harmed and, you know, couldn't get up or got lost and succumbed to the elements. So Kara and Lee flew into Bellingham to help investigators with the search for Leah. They scoured the area all around where the car had been found on foot. They used sniffer dogs and they used helicopters. Police checked all around the local hospitals to see if Leah had checked in or if anyone had checked in that matched her description with, you know, injuries from a car accident. Kara and Heath helped make missing persons flyers and posted them all around the nearby town, but still 
they didn't really come up with much. So after this, police took in the Jeep for processing along with the help from the FBI. Doing this, they discovered even more suspicious things within the car. First, they found $2,500 in cash within a pocket of a pair of pants that was in the car. This was a little bit strange because this meant that Leah would have only spent $500 of the $3,000 in cash that she had taken out outside of what we already know that she spent on her debit card. Next, under the floor mat in the driver's side of the car, they found Leah's mother's engagement ring, which was something that Leah very, very much cared about and absolutely cherished and was something that she wore literally every single day. Her friends stated that she would have never voluntarily taken off the ring for absolutely any reason because that's how much it meant to her. Additionally, police had stumbled across a few more items that Leah had collected along her road trip. They found a box of mementos that included a ticket stub from a 2 p.m. showing of American Beauty on March 13th at the Bellingham Fair Mall movie theater. So this indicated that Leah may have spent some time in the city after driving five or six hours from Brooks, Oregon, where she was known to have gotten gas and then had arrived in Bellingham five days before her car was discovered crashed. Police started questioning people around the movie theater to see if they had seen Lee, but no one had remembered seeing her. But then using the ticket stub from this show, police had decided to question some people at one of the bar restaurants in the mall since this particular restaurant was the only sit-down restaurant in the mall. They figured it was very possible that Leah stopped here for dinner after the show. They went around and asked a couple employees at this restaurant and there were a couple who remembered seeing her. One worker said that they saw her sitting alone, but then she was eventually met with two men who sat on either side of her. So police went to the public asking if if anyone knew who these two men were, and one of them actually did end up coming forward. One man had actually called and stated that he had actually spoken to Lee about the book that we had mentioned earlier and about her plans to travel to the Pacific Northwest. This man also confirmed that there had been another man sitting on the other side of her who Leah was speaking to. He told police that this man's name was Barry and gave police a description of this man and they were able to come up with a composite sketch of him. Now, Next, police went to the gas station that Leah was known to have stopped at and examined the security tapes. The video showed that she was alone at the gas station and appeared to be in pretty good condition. She didn't appear to look frazzled or dirty or anything like that. However, it did seem as if she was looking in a particular direction near the parking lot while she was waiting for her car to go through. This area of the parking lot was not in view of the cameras, so police don't know for sure exactly what she was looking at. However, this could indicate that maybe she was worried or that she was traveling with someone. The next lead that police had received happened the next day after the Jeep had been recovered when a witness had called into the police station and reported that him and his wife had actually seen Leah. He said that he saw her at a gas station near Everett, Washington, looking disoriented and confused. However, just as this man was giving out this tip, the man seemed to become suddenly very panicked and hung up the phone before police got a chance to get the man's name. Police thought that this could have been a credible tip, but they obviously found it strange that this man didn't really give up much information and hung up the phone and seemed very suddenly panicked. After this, there wasn't a ton of movement in the case. There was some media coverage like the original Unsolved Mysteries TV show and police had received some tips, but None of them brought anything forward or provide any more information to the case. But Kara and Heath had decided to let police keep Leah's car for the foreseeable future in case they ended up finding anything. And it's a really good thing that they did because in 2006, the original detectives on Leah's case had passed down Leah's files to two newer detectives and upon reviewing the evidence, these new detectives had found out that no one actually looked under the hood of Leah's Jeep. So they went ahead and decided to look under the hood. So after examining under the hood, these detectives discovered that the line to the starter relay was cut, which apparently allowed the car to accelerate without anyone actually being in the car. Now, I tried to look more into this to see if this was really a things. I have no idea. I wanted to see if this was really possible, but I know absolutely nothing about 
the information that I did find because I know absolutely nothing about cars, so it was really hard for me to read. So none of the information that I saw really made much sense to me because I don't know car terms. But apparently it is possible for a car to accelerate on its own. Another bit of evidence that these new detectives found was a fingerprint under the hood of the car, as well as a bit of male DNA on Leah's clothes. However, as far as I have seen, there has never been a match made to this DNA or the fingerprint. And as far as I have seen, that's pretty much all the information in this case. So now I wanna go ahead and get into all of the possible theories in Leah's case. So first of all, we have the theory that Leah just decided to up and leave her life. So obviously we know that Leah left on a road trip and it was going to be this whole self-discovery trip and she wanted to be on her own and she wanted to be off the grid for a while. That's not even a question, that is a fact in this case. So it could be possible that maybe she left and was planning on coming back, but then somewhere along the way, she just decided to leave forever. So it could be possible that she did decide to crash her car on purpose and make it look like she had a really bad accident, but was never in the car in the first place. Then after the crash, she took her cat and some of her personal belongings to start a new life. Maybe she came to this decision after meeting this man who the witness described her talking to at the restaurant. Maybe he convinced her to leave with him and said that he could take care of her for a while so that she could leave all of her stuff behind and she agreed and went with him and he took care of her until she rebuilt enough to support herself. Now, I could see this theory given what we know about her. Obviously, at this point in her life, she was mourning the loss of both of her parents. She just wanted to go and find herself. She didn't have absolutely anything holding her back. She just wanted to go off and to live her life and to see the world, and maybe she didn't want anyone coming to look for her. That's pretty obvious that she didn't want anyone to look for her because obviously she left and she didn't tell a single soul. Maybe she had decided that she wanted to go on an adventure with this new man or maybe she just wanted to go by herself and she decided to just stay there. Maybe she decided to live in a desolate wooded area in the Pacific Northwest. And maybe she knew that if she continued driving her car around that people would see it and obviously report the license plate number and would know where she was. And obviously she would have stopped using her bank card if she didn't want anyone to track her location. Not everyone is aware that they do have the right to go missing because yes, you can go missing as an adult as long as you're not you know, leaving behind kids or debt or whatever. And if police find you, you have the right to tell them, don't tell my family where I am. But not everyone knows that, and I would go as far as saying that most people probably don't know that, so she could have just wanted so bad to go off on her own, and so she staged this crash in hopes that no one would come looking for her. This theory could be possible, but there's also some pretty huge things pointing directly away from it. First of all, we know that she only gave a month's worth of rent and utilities to her roommate, which indicates that she's the kind of person who at least cares enough about her roommate being left with the full bill. This also obviously indicates that she didn't even plan on being gone for longer than a month. The reason I say this is because it doesn't seem that she would just decide to up and leave, leaving her roommate with the full bills after she was kind enough to leave money for rent for a month in the first place. If she was the type of person that was just gonna up and leave and leave Nicole with all of the responsibility, she would have done that from the very beginning. The other biggest thing is why would she leave her cash behind? Cash isn't traceable. There's no way that anyone could find her based on her you know, paper trail if she was just using cash. She had $2,500 that she had just left behind for absolutely no reason. Even if there was some man who wanted to help her stay hidden and wanted to help her run away, why would she just leave behind the $2,500? I don't care how much money someone has or is being offered. If I have that much money laying around, I'm gonna grab it. Plus, she left behind her mother's engagement ring in the car, which to me, you know, no matter how much you want to go off the grid, you aren't just going to leave behind your most prized possession like that, especially since it belongs to her mother who passed away and who she's never gonna see again. It just does not seem like something that she would just 
leave behind since she cherished it so much. Obviously, I don't think that she was trying to get rid of everything in her life to start a new life. I don't think that's the case. I think that if she did want to start a new life, she at least would have wanted to take in a few things with her. Now, some could argue that maybe she didn't even realize that she had lost the ring until it was too late. Maybe she didn't realize that she had taken it off at some point, you know, and then it was left in the car and then it was too late by the time she had gone looking for it because obviously you can't go back to the crash site after police show up to look for your ring. And then same thing with the cash. Maybe she didn't even realize that she left it in those pants pockets. Maybe she thought she had it with her. And then again, by the time she realized it wasn't there, she just couldn't go back and look for it. I don't know if I think that's very possible because that's a lot of money and it's her prized possession, but I guess that could be an argument for why she left those things behind. So the next theory is that foul play was involved. So with this theory, it's possible that as she was, you know, going across the country on this road trip, she met with someone who had bad intentions. Maybe it was this Barry guy who was seen with Lee right before the crash. So maybe you know, Barry and Lee had hit it off and she decided to hang out with him a little bit more, but then Barry took this as an opportunity to hurt a girl who he knew had no connection with anyone at that point in her life and had no one, you know, looking for her as far as she knew. She had no job to report to, she didn't have any classes to attend, and, you know, she up and left her family and friends, so maybe she had told him all of this and he knew that it wouldn't be very suspicious and that no one would come looking for her for quite a while and he took that as an opportunity to just hurt her. Or maybe, same situation, the two had been hanging out and then maybe he wanted a more sexual relationship and she turned him down and that made him upset so then he hurt her as a more spur of the moment thing. Or just in general, maybe she had just rejected him in any way and that made him upset. Maybe the two hadn't even been hanging out at all and he just wanted to hang out with her and he said no, so he followed her out and harmed her because of that. Or another thing that I kind of thought of is maybe the two were hanging out as more of a temporary thing. She was like, okay, you know, I'll hang out with this cool guy on my way up to the Pacific Northwest. And as she was going to leave, maybe he wanted to come with her or maybe he wanted her to stay and was really enjoying her company. And she was just like, no, you know, I have to go off and do this on my own. So he messed with her car and caused her to crash. So maybe he's the one that cut the lines in her car, caused her to go off the cliff and then just left her to die and, you know, wander around in the woods and succumb to the elements. Or maybe he caused this crash and was following her as he watched it all happen and then he took her in a more disoriented state and then harmed her or did whatever with her. Either way, it's possible that she was met with foul play from this man who she met at the bar. The other possibility within this theory is that maybe no one had messed with the car and that this was just a freak accident and she flew off the road and was staying in her car afterwards and was in a very disoriented and confused mental state. Obviously, if she had suffered a traumatic brain injury, she would not be in the right headspace. So again, maybe someone saw her in this state and just took it as an opportunity to take and harm her. Either way, the things that we mentioned before could indicate that foul play was involved. However, again, there are a lot of things that point away from this theory. The biggest fact being that there was absolutely no blood found in the car, which if she was being tossed around, there would be at least a little bit of blood. And we know that the seatbelt wasn't stretched. So we know that if she was in the car, she wasn't wearing her seatbelt. So that makes it even more likely that there would be blood somewhere in the car if she wasn't wearing her seatbelt and she was just being tossed around. So it's very strange that if someone did truly have it out for her and caused her to crash, that there's absolutely no evidence of anyone being in the car. This entire situation is just so confusing because the other thing that we know is that there were pillows and blankets set up in the car as if someone was living in the car after it had crashed. And to me, that can point to either theory. If she crashed and was hurt and was just maybe waiting there until she gathered some strength to leave and wandered off, you know, maybe she was the one that set this all up. If she had set the car herself to crash down the hill without her in it, and then, you know, 
went and camped out in the car to avoid being found. I could also see that being possible. I guess I could also see someone else finding her car and setting it up like that, maybe a homeless person, but at the same time, that really kind of doesn't make sense because how would this person know that there's pillows and blankets that are just gonna be in there? It could have been someone who knew Leah, I don't know. All of this is just such a big confusing mess. The other theory in terms of foul play being involved is that maybe someone took her and then took her car and caused it to go off the hill without her inside to make it look like an accident. So I think it's possible that it was either this Barry guy or some other guy that she had, you know, agreed to go on a date with or something like that. They took advantage of her, harmed her, took her somewhere, and then took her car and made it go off the hill to make it look like she had crashed so that no one would suspect whoever, you know, harmed her or took her. I think given what we know about what she left behind, the evidence in the car and the line being cut, to me, this does seem like the most likely theory. I personally think that foul play was involved and I think the person that is responsible is the one who sent the car off the road to throw police off. So other than that, there really aren't any other main theories. All I know is that Leah Roberts has been missing for 20 years now and we have absolutely no answers. She and her siblings experienced so much heartbreak and tragedy in their lifetimes that I can't even imagine how they're coping with this. Kara and Heath lost their mother, then their father, and then their sister in such a short period of time, which is just so absolutely devastating and I can't even imagine and my heart absolutely breaks for them. Leah Toby Roberts was only 23 years old when she went missing on March 1st, 2000 from Whatcom County, Washington. She was described as being a white female with sandy blonde hair and blue eyes, standing at 5 feet 6 inches tall, weighing 130 pounds at the time of her disappearance. She also has a surgical scar on her right hip. She would be 44 years old right now. If you have any information about Leah's disappearance, please contact the Whatcom County Sheriff's Office at 360-676-6650. So that is all of the information I have for today's video. And now I want to know what you guys think. Do you think that Leah just decided to go off on her own? Do you think that foul play was involved? And if so, how do you think that even happened? What do you make of the car going off? And it looking like no one was in the car. Please let me know your thoughts in the comments below. If you liked this video, please make sure to leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to follow my Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked down below. If you have absolutely any case suggestions, please make sure to go ahead and send them over to my email at rachelshannoncases at gmail.com. With that, I hope you guys have a great week and I hope to see you next time. Bye.